pray with me as we continue this morning? Heavenly Father, we uh, again are truly thankful for the day you've given us, God. I thank you for all of those who've come out today. Lord, uh, you are truly good, and Lord, we just want to lift you up today. Father, um, in spite of the fact that, Lord, there's so many things, uh, Lord, that's happened through this last week and has happened in our nation and even around the world that we might consider to be tragic, uh, God, I'm thankful that you are still on the throne. And God, uh, I know that the day's coming, Lord, when there will be peace on earth again. And uh, Lord, I pray for now that you would give us peace in our hearts in the midst of troubles and trials and challenges. And, and God, uh, I pray that we'd live life to the fullest, Lord, uh, in Christ Jesus. Lord, truly you do live today. And God, uh, you are very present in this place. And we acknowledge you. I pray, God, that you'd move in the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives this morning. Challenge us and change us forever. And Lord, I do pray that if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that, God, this would be the day of salvation for them. And Lord, we just praise you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Well, let's uh, worship together. We're singing a, an old hymn first, Come Christians Join to Sing. And let's just all sing our praise to the Lord together. Thank you. 
Our scripture today comes from Revelations verse, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat at the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son.
the lost become the found. You can never be defeated, for you wear the victor's crown. You are Jesus the Messiah, you're the hope of all the world. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you.
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, that choir song was amazing. Thank you, Brother Kevin and choir. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Well, I'm excited today to have Greg and Donna Fort with us. They are IMB missionaries. Uh, they work with the International Mission Boards, which is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. And for some of you who are new to us, this may be brand new, <laughs> but we are a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We support missionaries through our convention, such as Greg and Donna Fort, and they are here from Durban, South Africa. And uh, I think they're actually staying over in Bryan, Texas is where they're residing right now and uh, doing some traveling and visiting in some of the churches. And uh, I'm assuming y'all are going back to Durban eventually. We are. And uh, so we want to keep them in our prayers. But this morning uh, we have uh, Greg coming to share with us from God's word for a few moments. And again, we'll hang around at the end of the church if you have questions uh, for us. We do have a table down here you might want to come up and take a look at. You get on their prayer letter, uh, that sort of thing. So, Greg, why don't you come and share with us as God leads you, brother? Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bless you, brother. Thank you. Church family, I, I can't begin to tell you what a privilege uh, it is for Donna and me to be able to worship with you today. Um, I was just sitting here reflecting on, on our journey uh, because I grew up on the mission field. My parents were missionaries before me, and um, they went to Africa in 19, thought I was in a strobe light thing there for a minute. You know, I was like, oh, I've arrived. I've got strobe lights going here. And um, so my folks were missionaries back in the day um, when it meant a whole lot maybe more difficult maybe uh, than it is today. It took them six weeks to get from New Orleans to Cape Town on an, on an ocean freighter. They had an old Dodge World War II surplus power wagon and uh, a Jeep trailer uh, in the hold of that ship uh, that they unloaded in Cape Town. And then they drove from there up to southern Rhodesia uh, to begin their missionary career. And um, Donna comes from a missionary family. Her mom and dad went to Liberia. Um, after Don and I were married, God called them. They spent four years in Liberia doing agricultural missionary work, uh, used agriculture and teaching English as a way to launch a platform to be able to share the faith, um, used a, a well drilling rig from Georgia. Um, and out of that, it's been incredible to see, even though they were there for four years, um, God raised up some young men under them who have taken the gospel far further than any of us ever could have. Um, the one young man actually opened a school so that they could use education as a means to teach the Bible. And it's called, it's Donna's mother died, but it's named in her honor, the Betty uh, Memorial Institute. And so it's just amazing to see how we come through these missionary cycles and how God calls out people. Um, I didn't get saved until I was 13. I had fought God for three years and but once God saved me, almost fairly close to that, God called me into ministry. And one of our missionaries said, Greg, you need to get a sermon together because you're going to preach it the next time you come home for school holidays. So at the ripe old age of 14, um, out in the middle of the African bush with a group of people sitting under a tree in the shade uh, on benches that were made from, you know, two fork sticks stuck in the ground and a log stuck across there, you never go to sleep, and no, nobody ever, because if you fall asleep, you fall off the log into the dirt. And, um, but I remember at the end of that, I mean, I preached John 10.10, 10, uh, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And I remember at the end of that service, as a 14-year-old, there was an, an, an old African lady that came and knelt to receive Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. In the meantime, Donna was doing the, the RA, I mean the GAs and the Actines thing. She was queen with scepter. So God was preparing her heart on this side of the ocean as I was on that side of the ocean uh, for us to get together and for God to call us into missionary service. And uh, 1987, we went to Zimbabwe um, to do rural church planting. Uh, we had a two-year-old, Donna was seven months pregnant when we got on the airplane, because if you get past seven months, you can't fly until six weeks after the baby's born. So we, 
uh, we got ourselves on an airplane and um, had an incredible 30 years in Zimbabwe serving the Lord. Um, I love rural work. I, I love it because it's outside and it's kind of the African bush and it gave me opportunities to do the, some of the things that I enjoy, hunting and fishing and four-wheel drive stuff and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, that's just kind of a God thing. And we had three sons, and it's great to raise boys in Africa, you know, to go camping when there are elephants and lions in your campsite. And, I mean, that's just amazing, right? And um, to live out this, this dream thing of mine and... Um, Donna was not quite as excited about elephants in the campsite as I was. I'm taking pictures and she was petrified in the mouth of the tent as this elephant swung his trunk around to smell to see what was going on in the tent. And I'm going, wow, look at this. This is amazing. This is National Geographic right here. And Donna's going, if that elephant steps on my son, you're dead. You know, it's one of those. <laughs> It's an amazing journey. And as Donna shared with the Sunday school class, after 30 years, and y'all, we lived through some very difficult times in Zimbabwe. Um, our economy totally crashed. Um, the grocery stores went empty. Um, food was difficult to find. Getting gas for your car at times was impossible. Uh, you would join a queue that was maybe two miles long, and people were pushing their cars trying to get to the pump. And when you finally got to the pump, um, you could get five gallons of gas. Well, that hardly gets you home, right? You know what I'm saying? And um, so they were very difficult days, but in the midst of very difficult days, uh, God did amazing work uh, among his people. And there are things that we got to be a part of that today continue to bear fruit and continue to grow. It's been phenomenal uh, to see how God used who we were. Donna uh, taught at our Baptist seminary. She taught Old Testament. Uh, she taught hermeneutics. She taught New Testament. She taught ministry or missions in the context of local church. Had an amazing ministry discipling young men and women who today are some of the critical leaders for the, the gospel and the kingdom in the country of Zimbabwe. And so we, we actually thought, okay, we've done 30 years and we came back to the States um, I served a church in northeast Oklahoma for two years, and then God began to or orchestrate circumstances to call us back to Durban, from the bush to a city of four million people. And y'all, I don't know diddly about cities. I'm just going to tell you, I, I don't like the traffic, I don't like the pollution, I don't like the noise. I don't like the crowds. I don't like to feel crowded. I don't like to be crowded. And it's like, so God, why in the world would you call us into an environment where we are so uncomfortable? And it's because that's where you depend on God the most, right? That's, God's about himself. He's not about us. God's about himself. And we just begin to watch as God invested our lives in the lives of individuals, which was a new thing for me. That, that, that our, the story of our life finds its fullest meaning when God writes the story in the lives of other people. And um, a man across the street who had cancer, and because of COVID, they couldn't have people around them to care. Um, but because we lived right across the street, I could go over twice a day and, and physically pick him up while his wife bathed him and changed him and changed the sheets. And if you've ever walked those journeys, you know what it's like. And then to have this really amazing time to prepare Gerald to meet the Lord. Uh, to understand what that journey looks like and how God was going to call him home and what his homecoming was going to feel like and to make sure his relationships with his children and his wife were where they needed to be. An amazing journey, amazing journey. God brought a young lady into our life that had some deep, deep, deep spiritual issues, uh, bondage to Satan in a way that I had never witnessed before. But y'all, God brought her into our lives because God loves her and God wanted to redeem her. And so we got to be part of her redemption. And her picture is actually on the poster board. I got the privilege of baptizing her. Amazing time. A young man, Tolong, that came to me one day at the gym when he found out I was a preacher and said, man of God, what does a man have to do to find God? And here was a young orphan boy that was struggling, had a sister, if you can imagine, a sister in the 11th grade who lived by herself, went to school by herself, did her homework by herself, fixed all her food by herself, washed all of her clothes by herself. And he came to Durban to get a job to try to help support her. 
in this just difficult, who loves me? What is the value of my life? And um, he'd actually, on a Saturday night, felt like he just needed to commit suicide and end his life. And that next Wednesday, we were together, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And so we've just seen God do incredible things out of 4 million people. God had us really invest our lives in some individuals. That's been an amazing journey. But y'all, that's something that we do together. So I just want to, to share with you uh, 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 a message. Y'all, up here there are some prayer cards that, that we had printed. You're more than welcome to take one of those and put it on the fridge or wherever you put things like that to just be a, a reminder to pray for us and to intercede as God lays us on your heart. And we've had people say, God wakes me up in the middle of the night to pray. Um, and that's really important for us to know that there are that there are people who pray. Would you join me now and pray? I just want to ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, this is your word. <laughs> These are your people. You are their heavenly father. You love them. You redeemed them at a tremendous cost. In and through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ shed for their sin to redeem them to restore right relationship to you and father you need to take your word and match your word to the needs of our lives and our hearts and father sweet holy spirit we, we depend on you to be the teacher of the word of god uh, you were there when each word was written down you have protected its authenticity throughout history and it remains a faithful testimony to the word of God. And we're so deeply grateful. So Holy Spirit, would you, would you just speak? Um, would you drive home the word of God? And may our hearts just resonate with it. And, and may, it be, may it find fertile soil within us. And may it bring forth the fruit that you desire. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would open them with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, I'm, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and then jump down to verse 13. Uh, this afternoon, between nap and supper, you can fill in the, the, the other parts of those verses. But, but let me read these verses for us. So the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And then verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? I've entitled this sermon, um, Missions from the Pew. Because it's really, it's not easy for those of us that live on the mission field to connect missions, right, with where you're sitting. So that you sitting there figure out, so how do I fit into this thing that we call missions? What is it that, that God would, would call me to do and, and how do I interface and relate? So what I want you to help you understand today is that missions exist. The reason that we do missions as a church as a, as a denomination, as an organization, Don and I with our lives, is because missions exist because worship does not. God created us to worship Him. God actually created all people to worship Him. And the reason that we have to talk about missions, that we share Jesus Christ, is because there are places today, there are homes today, neighborhoods today, where people cannot worship and do not worship God. From, a, from an international perspective, we know that there are 3,000 people groups that yet to have a witness of Jesus Christ in their language in a way that they can understand and respond to him. But y'all, there are neighbors that we have that are not worshiping Jesus Christ today. And so missions exists 
because worship does not. So, you know, when I, was, I was, when I was preparing this and thinking through it, I thought, you know who the first missionary was? The first person that went looking for people who could not worship because of the sin of their life, it was actually God, and it would have been in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve sinned. They broke relationship to God. We know the consequences of sin. They were ashamed. They were embarrassed. And when God came walking, they hid themselves. They hid from God. God was the first missionary. He went looking for Adam and Eve because they had broken fellowship and could no longer worship God, and God wanted that restored. So in the Garden of Eden, God came into the Garden to restore fellowship, relationship with Adam and Eve. And God did something that was a precursor to what Jesus Christ would do. God sacrificed animals, shed the blood of animals so that he could take their skins to make a covering, right? A covering for Adam and for Eve which was a precursor to why Jesus Christ had to come. Jesus came because relationship between God and man was broken by sin. By whose sin? My sin. Your sin. Your sin broke relationship. And Jesus Christ had to come and die, shed his blood on the cross so that relationship could be restored. So it is true. It is true. That, that missions exist because worship does not. It is also true that missions is restoring right relationship to God. Is that fair enough? Missions exist because worship does not. And the purpose of mission then is to restore right relationship with God. Is that definition important? Are there things we could do in the name of mission that would not necessarily restore right relationship between people who are lost and their creator? Oh yeah. There's a lot of things we do in, 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 that are good, right? But they're not necessarily missions if they don't focus on restoring right relationship. So those two statements are, are, are really important and they are really significant. You know, the thing about this passage of Scripture... That, um, that just so speaks to me. By the time you get to Luke chapter 11, can anybody think of miracles that Jesus might have performed by the time we get to Luke chapter 11? By the time we get to Luke chapter 11, has Jesus already fed the 5,000? You can nod your head. This is really easy. Okay, you can nod your head. Yes, he has. Has Jesus, by the time you get to Luke chapter 11, has he raised anybody from the dead? You can nod your head, it's okay, right? He's raised people from the dead. Has he healed? Has he healed people who were terminally ill like the lepers? Yes. Has he delivered those who were demon-possessed, who had demonic spirits living within them? Yes, he has. So by this time in Luke's gospel, Jesus Christ has already ably demonstrated his power, right? His power over nature, his power over evil, his power over physical illness and disease. He's already proven that he is God in the flesh. What is interesting to me about this request, Jesus is praying in verse 1. He's praying. Disciples are watching him pray. By now, what do the disciples know about Jesus Christ and his relationship to his heavenly father? Is it pretty important to him? Does the Bible say that Jesus would get up early in the morning and go out to a, a lonely place and spend time with his heavenly father? Yeah, you can nod your head, it's okay. Did Jesus ever go out and spend the whole night in prayer? Just him and the father in an in intimate relationship, praying to the father? Oh yeah, he did. Had the disciples in John chapter 5, and I was going to read it, but I'm not going to take time. Had, had the disciples already heard Jesus say, the Son can do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the Father do, that is what he does. So they had heard Jesus say, the Son can do nothing by himself. So the disciples kind of began to, some, some little light bulb came on. There's something about the intimacy that Jesus has with his Father 
that the Father then empowers the Son to do these things that we witness. Is it not interesting that the disciples then come to him and say, uh, Jesus, can you teach us how to do miracles? Now that would have been me. There's some TV preachers that think they've figured out how to do miracles. You know what I'm saying? It's not about prayer, right? It's about what I, what I pr purport to do. They didn't come and say, Jesus, can, can you teach us that magic prayer that when we pray it, it'll take a few loaves of bread and a few fish and multiply it so that 5,000 people can. Can you teach us how to do that? Jesus, can you, can you teach us specifically how when we encounter a leper you know, whose, whose skin is, and flesh is being eaten away by that disease, can you teach us how to spit just right so we can heal a blind man? That's not what they ask. What they ask is, this disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. You know why we struggle with prayer? Because we'd rather do something. Right? We'd rather do something. We'd rather get busy or dirty or sweat then stop and pray. Our, our whole culture is built around doing stuff, right? Right? Do stuff. Don't just sit there, do, do anything. Doing anything's better than doing nothing. Jesus said, don't do anything until you've prayed. You pray until the Father shows you what he's about and then you, you join the Father in what he's doing. And when we take this prayer, if you read it in, in Matthew chapter, chapter 6, 9 to 11, it's only 66 words long. And y'all, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a I'll be careful, it's not like a, a, a very holy, reverend kind of a prayer. It's full of these and thous and wherefores and it's not a prayer like that, 66 words. But it is a prayer that invites us into intimacy with the Father. And it is, it is intimacy that, that speaks to who we are and what missions, what missions is. So the first thing I would like to share with you is that intimacy with the Father begins with true worship. Intimacy with the Father begins with true worship. I so appreciate it. Kevin, thank you so much for the way that you led worship. Do you know what worship is designed to do? This is not the throne of God. Amen. This, this is not the throne of God. But this is to invite us into the throne room of God. Amen? This unites our hearts together, pulls us together, and together we ascend into the throne room of heaven. I was reading Revelation this morning where there's this angel that has this censer, and the censer is full of the prayers of the saints. And it rises like incense before the throne of God. When we pray, we, we put incense into that golden censer. And those prayers rise before God. And so this intimacy with the Father, that it, it begins with true worship. And Jesus used the word here. I have got the wrong word up there. Y'all forgive me for that. I was doing things and not thinking. But it's pater, which is, which is the word for father, not the, not the Abba word for daddy. But still, for Jesus to say, you get to call God your heavenly father was transformational. Right? God had always been the Lord God. You know? The distant the Lord God who can strike thunder and whatever. And Jesus says when you talk to God, it's intimate. It's, he's your heavenly father and, and he calls you into this relationship. And he says that we are to call the name of God holy. That there's something about God that he is holy. And can I just admonish all of us? The word awesome ought only to be associated with God the Father. Awesome means worthy of worship. That's what that word means. Football is not awesome, and baseball is not awesome. And as much as I love fresh pie, pie is not awesome. Only God, right, is awesome, right, that he inspires awe when we come into his presence. We all, the second thing about this intimacy is that intimacy with the Father actually defines, right, it defines our life's purpose. Because Jesus said, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But then he says, your kingdom come. 
why would Jesus invite you and me to, to, to live our lives and to focus our prayer life on the coming of the Father's kingdom? And then he even defines what it means for the Father's kingdom to come when he says, your will be done, what? On earth, as your will is done. You ever ask yourself how the will of God is done in heaven? Is it always perfect? Is the will of God in heaven always perfectly done? Is, are the angels, when they do the will of God, um, are, are they discouraged and despondent and grumbling? And you know, if I have to go, you know, no, no, no. do you think that's what the will of God looks like? Well, I don't think so. I mean, the, the whole picture of the angels flying with their wings is that they are ready, excited, anticipating, doing the will of God. So we get to pray, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done, not just on earth, y'all, but your will be done. Right? Don't you want the will of God to be done in your own life? Don't you want the will of God to reflect your, your marriage and your family? And don't you want the will of God to be that which draws and unites this church together, the will of God? Don't you want the will of God to be the thing that when people talk about Jew at Texas, they would say that's where the will of God is being perfectly done. Do you know what happens when the will of God is perfectly done? I think, I think, um, I think taverns have a hard time staying open when the will of God is perfectly done. Amen? I mean, I, I, think, I think people that, you know, that, that, are, that, are, that are broken, they get rightly related to God and it transforms life. So, so God, this intimacy with the Father, right, it, it begins in true worship, but, but it, it defines life's purpose. I need to quit just shortly, but let me just say, uh, we, we had an old, 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 old man who had been heavily involved in African traditional worship and he had been the spirit medium between his people and, and the, these ancestral spirits and we were in his village, we shared faith, he trusted Jesus, we were having a baptismal service, we invited the old man to come. He came, but we'd not, unbeknownst to us, the night before those spirits had come and said, if you get baptized tomorrow, we're going to kill you. <laughs> so he's standing on the edge of the water and we're in the water and um, we're baptizing people and we ran out of people, but he was still standing. He didn't want to get in the water. And we said, is there not anybody else? And finally hesitated. He, he stepped into the water and he came to me. Old man, no teeth, wrinkled skin, white-headed. And I said, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Will you follow Jesus and never turn back? Yes. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today you will die to self. Oh. And you will rise to walk in newness of life. And when he came up out of the water, he just stood still for a minute. What's in his mind? I'm going to die. But it's worth dying to know Jesus. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. And he broke out into song. I have been set free. I had been bound by the chains of Satan. And praise God, I've been set free. Intimacy with the Father. Y'all, it, it, it defines our purpose for life and for living. It was, it was the most remarkable thing. Well, quickly. Intimacy with the Father's expressed independence. Give us this day our daily bread. Bread is the most essential element in, in Jewish life, right? Daily bread. God, give us our daily bread. God, I want my life to be so dependent upon you that I trust you for the very basic needs of my life. Is that a place of rest or a place of turmoil? Trusting God for your daily bread. Is that a stressful place or a good place? Well, I think it's a good place. I think it's a good place to be where we trust God for the daily needs of our life. The alternative is we trust, right? And maybe, I don't know. And um, that can lead to all kinds of things. So we, we this intimacy with the Father is, is just reflected, right, in, in our dependence upon Him. 
And our intimacy with the Father is reflected in our daily relationships. Did, did Jesus, when he redeemed us, say, okay, you're, you're never going to sin again? You're never going to encounter a broken relationship again? You're never going to say the wrong thing again? You're, you're never going to break fellowship with the Father again? Is that what he said? No, 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 that's not what he said. So give us this day our daily bread, but forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who's indebted to us. Jesus acknowledges the reality of life, that in life, you and I, that we sin, that we break relationship, that we have issues and there's problems. But what is the cure for that? Forgiving, being forgiven, so that we can have good relationships this way and a good relationship that way. So intimacy with the Father just acknowledges that sin is real, that temptation is real, that sometimes we stumble and fall, but as God sought out Adam and Eve, God seeks us out to restore that relationship. We all, just in conclusion, because our, our time is gone, here's some things that I just want to say about, about missions. And this is missions from the pew. This is for each one of us. That first one up there is really important to me. Missions is bringing the, the presence of God and the power of God and the proclamation of the gospel into every relationship. Is that fair enough? Missions is bringing the presence of God. You embody the power. You embody the Holy Spirit. You embody God in, within you. And every conversation you have, you get to bring the person of God into that conversation, his presence and his power, and you get to bring the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ into every conversation. So think about the grocery store. Think about the mailman. Think about the delivery person. For us, Donna, was it yesterday? Day before yesterday. I've forgotten. The Jehovah's Witnesses came to our door. <laughs> Praise God. God is so good. I got to talk to them about eternal life and about this assurance that I have in Jesus, that I know him that I've known of the Father. Right? So the presence of God, the power of God, and the proclamation of the gospel. Y'all, secondly, missions is daily praying for God's kingdom to come. And it might be that God's kingdom needs to come with your neighbor next door. Right? It might be that God's kingdom needs to come in your own family, but every day we are praying for God's kingdom to come and, and looking for divine opportunities to participate in that. Missions is taking your life. Sometimes we say you're yes. And just go ahead and put it on God's altar. God, I'm going to take my life. I'm going to put it on your altar. You do with my life whatever you want to. Is that fair enough? We just met a guy for, who worked for Chevron in Angola. And he worked for Chevron in Kazakhstan. But because he did that, he said, I need to be able to figure out how to share the gospel and partnered with an organization that shares the gospel in the Middle East. And out of working for them, they would fly him over there for work and then he would take time to go share the gospel in Jordan and Amman and, and in, in, uh, in Egypt. And, and amazing, right? Because his yes was on God's altar. So just take your yes, God, you use me in your kingdom. Take your yes, put it on God's altar, let God do whatever he wants to. And then your missions is partnering to support and to encourage God-called servants as they live out their calling. Your pastor and his wife, uh, Don and me, we covet and value your prayer for us and your encouragement for us. Say so all missions, this thing that we call missions, missions from the pew, missions from where you sit. The Lord's Prayer, inviting us to pray God's kingdom come. Being intimate with the Father because out of Jesus' intimacy with the Father, God did everything in and through the life of Jesus Christ that he needed to do. But it flowed from that centeredness out of his relationship to God. Would that be true in your life? If Jesus can do nothing of himself, but only that what he sees the Father do, am I any different? I don't think so. I don't think so. But then would you understand that God has put you exactly where God has put you because he wants his kingdom to come in you, around you, and through you. Is that fair enough? Is that fair enough? So that's what missions from the pew looks like. God, here's my life. You use it to allow your kingdom to come in me, through me, to your glory.
Amen? Let me pray for us. Father God, you are good, and you are gracious, and you are kind. And Father, you have blessed Donna and me with the privilege to be with these, your children. Our hearts are encouraged. And Father, we're so grateful that we live for the sake of eternity. And Father, we do want to be mission in how we live our lives. We do want them to matter from the perspective of eternity. And Father, I think each one of us in this room, we know somebody right now who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Father, eternity is at stake. You love them. You desire to redeem them. Christ has already paid the penalty for their sin. And so, Father, may we just ask you to use our lives. May we give you our lives. May you empower them for your kingdom. May you use us to be missional in how we live every single day that you might receive honor and glory. Father, we love you. Thank you for what you're doing around the world. Thank you for what you're doing in Durban today. Thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your children here in Jewett today. And we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Thank you, Greg, for sharing with us this morning. As we draw to a close this morning, maybe God is speaking to you could be this morning he's speaking to some of you about putting your life on the altar of God as brother Greg has just mentioned and just saying to God God whatever your will is Lord your will be done in me as your will is done in heaven above you can trust God he wants the very best for you and your life and he will use you if you give your life fully to him could be the day that you've never trusted Christ, never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I believe with all my heart that you're not here by accident, that God is already at work, and he's arranged the circumstances in your life to bring you to this point of making that decision for him. Somebody needs to come to Christ today, whatever your need. God is speaking, and God will answer your request if you will come to him I'm going to pray and after I pray we're going to all stand and sing and as we stand to sing if you need to come and pray whatever God's dealing with you about then you come Father we thank you for what we've heard thank you for Greg and Donna and their willingness to give their lives Lord on mission for you Lord uh, I do pray for every person in this auditorium and and yes, Lord, even those who will be watching online. and God, I just pray that, that we would all surrender to you fully, wholly, completely. God, here we are. Use us for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. As we stand, as God speaks, you come, would you? You need to be saved, come. God is speaking to you about something. You just need to come and pray. You come. Whatever your need, come as we sing. Come on. Marvelous.